Hello and welcome back to another episode of Soccer Supernova with me, Amy Canavan. Today I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by the former Celtic youth product, Paul Shields. Paul, thank you so much for joining us. How are you? Hey, I'm good, Amy. Thanks. I uh, appreciate you inviting me on. Absolutely. How, um, how's lockdown been treating you? Um, it's, this one's been all right. The first one... The first one, I must admit, I did find tough. Um, obviously, just not being able to do anything and stuff. This one's been slightly different in that um, I've been able to work. So, still going out and, 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 to be honest, not much has changed for me, really. Um, but, yeah, it's, I, I've actually enjoyed this one because, like I say, I'm out working. I'm still getting like social interaction with people. Um, so, yeah, I've quite enjoyed this one. But the one before was, I wouldn't want to go back to that again. It was a bit tough, wasn't it? It was. Like, I think it was just a shock to everyone. Yeah. Um, but I think, really as well, it's taught taught us all quite a bit as well. Do you know what I mean? Of, I think it kind of made us all step back a little bit and um, realise what's what's important to us. Spending a bit more time with family. Um, but let's be honest, we were all delighted when it when it opened up again and we could start getting back to work. Absolutely, we certainly were. So before we get into what's been keeping you busy these days, let's go right back to the start. Yeah. Where did the football dream really begin for you? Um, really, just. Just as young as I can remember, to be honest, um, I was always, my dad and my granddad were always taking me to games from, from as soon as I could go, really. Um, and so just at school, constantly playing football with my mates and I was a huge Rangers fan. With them. Like I say, my dad and my granddad were always taking me to Ibrox, um, which I'm sure you'll pick up on later on. Um, so just that, you know, in my head, I was, I was just always going to be a footballer. Um, and then the minute I could join a team, uh, I was I was straight into it and joined. I think it was Hill of Heath when I was twelve. So yeah, from that moment on, I was just that was all in my head. I was just uh, I was going to be a footballer. End of story. Uh, and to be honest, I'm, I'm grateful that I was able to do it. Was it always going to be a striker? I think so. Yeah, I always wanted the glory. Not that not that it really not that it really really happened very much in the in the professional career. But that was it. I just yeah, I was. I'll, I'll be honest. I was all about the the glory, scoring goals. I just that's. For me, that's what football was all about. So you're kicking about in Fife. Was it um, obviously a, a Rangers fan? But Wraith Rovers came calling. That's a big local team. Was it? Was it? Um, how was that? So that that was good. At that at that time, I did have a had a few options. Um, I think uh, Dundee United had a chance to go there. But you're right. Wraith was a local one. Um, They'd, they they made a real effort to get me, which I think is what impressed me more than anything. And you know, I had Alex Smith, and he came out to the house one time. I knew that the the youth team coaches there were were Terry Butcher, John Brownlee, you know, such massive names. And for me, obviously, Terry Butcher was a was a big draw. Um, obviously, Jimmy Nicol was the first team manager as well. So it was kind of a no-brainer at that point I had left school and I started working my dad got me a job as a, an apprentice draftsman so it was like a four-year apprenticeship and I hated every minute of it so the minute um, I think I was playing for a team called Milton Green at the time and the minute I got an opportunity that was all I was ever doing um, but you know the job actually it turned out quite a good pull really because because I was earning better money um, in that my dad um, I don't know how he managed to do it but he spoke to Wraith and, and managed to get me what I was earning at that job as an apprentice draftsman instead of the actual I think it was like 50 quid a week the boys were getting so I managed to go and get a wee bit more than the rest of them um, <laughs> which to be fair a few of them did start to find out about it I'm not sure how but uh, it didn't go down too well <laughs> So Jimmy Nicol and Terry Butcher in that setup. how much interaction did you have with them even at such a young age? Constantly it was constant the, the youth team and the first team all trained like on the same patch we all travelled together uh, going up to Beveridge Park we all ate together um, so much Like when I look back on that they were tough on us like, I can't lie they were really tough on us um, but honestly, I look back on that that period of time, and I think anyone who was in that setup will will agree with me that it was amazing. It was just it was, it was just a great time. Um, as I say, they, they had us doing things like you know, even even just the jobs we were doing. You know, we were sometimes weren't leaving there till half five, six o'clock. Um, sitting there waiting on getting the green light to go home and you know Alex Smith would would then have a wee wander around and run his finger across a door frame that was. They had a door frame that had never been walked through in years find some dust and then all of a sudden uh, a group of us are, have got the dusters out trying to trying to get it all cleaned up and little things like that we, we cursed it at the time but you look back it was amazing and you know they had even had us going down uh, Long Annette Pits we had to go and do a shift 
down the pitch like with the rest of the and I remember thinking like this is this is crazy like and you probably wouldn't be allowed to do it now but honestly looking back and Alex Smith was always saying that he was doing it because he wanted us to see how good we had it um, and it definitely worked it was it was to be honest it was it was a great thing and I think most young players should should do stuff like that now and I know it probably will never, never happen but um, it was certainly good for us. That integration with the first team as well, does it give you that drive to be, I want to be one of those guys and not be that, that youth, just be a youth product? It definitely does. I think we, we had such a good group and the, and the first team guys were brilliant as well. Um, as I say, we, we cleaned all their boots and there was always banter. They were just in the way changing room. We were in the, sorry, they were in the home changing room. We were in the away changing room. So we were right next to each other. Um, and you start, you do, you start to look up to them and you start to see them you know, and be scoring goals, getting a little bit of publicity here and there, and you do, you really start to look up to them and, and just want to be, first and foremost, you want to be doing what they're doing. So, you know, it, it, it was brilliant, it was just such a good time that I, I look back on and always have a little smile about it. So, you're kicking around Wraith, and then, as you say, Rangers fan, how does um, Celtic come along then? That was, that was, uh, just totally out of the blue, I, I seem to remember playing a game. Um, we played Airdrie, and it was a closed doors game. And I do remember at the start of it, um, a few people saying that it was actually um, John Barnes was at the game, um, and I, I didn't know whether he was or he wasn't. Um, but I since found out that he was at the game, um, and he was there to watch me, so. I played, can't remember if I scored or anything, but I do remember being quite happy with how I played. Um, and then before you know it, I just remember the, the manager pulling me in and, and saying that we've had an offer from Celtic. And it was such a strange thing for me because, um, as I say, I had went from uh, joining joining Wraith Rovers at 16. And in joining Wraith Rovers, that was when I stopped going to Rangers games because I, I obviously couldn't go on a Saturday. Um, but I still had my season ticket in my name. Um, which I gave to another family member. So I just remember thinking how surreal it was. The whole thing was just was just strange. And um, there had been actually talk before about when I first broke into the first team, there was a few things about um, Rangers that were interested. There was always little little bits here and there. And again, I remember playing a... There was a closed doors game at Ibrox. And I had went through. I wasn't due to play in it because I had been uh, playing with the first team. So... I was getting saved for that and I just remember someone saying to me, look, you have to play in this game today. So obviously I kind of got, got a feeling that it was because they wanted to see me. I didn't have boots or anything like that. And before you know it, someone's came running through and I've, uh, I had to wear Tony Vidmar's boots, believe it or not. They were they were about two sizes too big. Um, so anyway, I played in the game, obviously didn't play too well. So <laughs> nothing else came of that. But yeah, the Celtic thing was strange, I have to admit. It was... Um, and then, like you say, when family members and everyone started to get wind of it, it was just, just bizarre. Because my whole family was was Rangers fans, but at the end of the day, it was a it, you're not going to say no to Kenny Dalglish. Exactly. I was just going to touch on that. What was your your dad and your granddad's um, reaction to that? Obviously, that, it's hard to turn down Celtic, but obviously. Yeah, I mean that's something that still kind of gets to me. This this day really is just I always think about my my granddad in this situation and. Um, you know, he was the biggest Rangers fan going. He always, he's always buying the Rangers news every week. And whenever I was at his house when I was younger, I would sit and read these, and, and he kept them all for me, he piled them up. And then before you know it, because he was, he was that proud. He was, he was then buying like the the Celtic Weekly magazine, and he was piling them up. And you know, they, they were at my like my first game when I when I played at uh, Celtic Park in Starbardine. They were there and. Um, yeah, they, they were proud. Like, I can't lie, they were they were proud, and, and it was nice. You know what I mean? It was nice. That's all I think you want when you're younger is just to obviously make your your family proud, especially your your dad and your granddad who have been taking you to all these games. But it was a nice nice moment to see them um, obviously swallowing their pride a little bit and, and going to Celtic Park to watch me. <laughs> you touched upon it. Um, you were, you were in fact Kenny Douglas's last signing at Celtic. Yeah. How? big an attraction was that obviously you're a striker yourself again a Rangers fan as he was and um, what was that pool like uh, huge and it, I didn't know obviously obviously Kenny Douglas is, is a legend like for for anyone that that follows Scotland but I hadn't seen much of him obviously I was I was too young I hadn't but constantly informed again by dad granddad you know 
and it, it did kind of become apparent from them that you know you you, you can't say no to this man like do you know what I mean and then obviously meeting him I just had this aura about him that was was incredible that I just knew that that's I was never saying no to him it wouldn't have mattered what they offered me or anything like that um, I was I was never saying no to him and I just when I look back on it it's probably unfortunate he wasn't there much longer after I went. Um, and maybe things might have been different I don't know um, but no I was, I was certainly not saying no to him and he was a massive pull for me going there You're walking in to, to Parkhead and the, the team there is one of the best in the last 20-25 years obviously yeah. at Celtic your Larsons your Sussons your Hartsons what's it like stepping in and, as a young kid and seeing these massive names? Again really really surreal in a way do you know what I mean because I was still young I was still I think uh, I think it's 18 maybe you know and, and and young and like you say it, it just seemed like it just seemed like yesterday I was at school and I'm watching these guys and um, then to step in and and be training with them and seeing the way they worked and, and just you're right they just had a total aura but if I'm being honest if I'm being totally honest I think it got the better of me um, a lot of times because I just I was just this kid from Fife do you know what I mean who just just liked playing football um, and then all of a sudden you're like you're in you're in the real world with these guys and you're starting to have to, having to think can I can I get past these guys do you know what I mean and, and obviously it's a, it's a difficult difficult job a little bit overwhelming at times do you believe when you first go in that you maybe you do have a chance that there is an opportunity there you see it's very tough with that front line in front of you mm-hmm. but is there any sort of indication that wow I maybe could break through here that's a good question um, I, I do think that I think when I first went there, a hundred percent, I adopted that attitude. Um, as time went on, I probably didn't, and that's that's I think only uh, my issue. That's nobody else's issue. Nobody ever made me feel like I couldn't, um, like I couldn't get in with these guys. And you know, I'd already made my debut. And um, but yeah, you know, I look at guys like Tommy Burns. Tommy Burns spent a hell of a lot of time with like the young guys. He wanted the best for us all the time. He always made us feel like we were we were the next best things. Like we were we were going to get in that first team. And and I, and I do think, and I, and I totally believe that. I just think it's a it's a sink or swim moment where you you know you prepared to do the hard work. Um, and I think I look back on it now with total regrets. I think. Um, I wish I didn't and I was always told like don't have any regrets in football but unfortunately that's definitely one of mine where you know I was probably one of the first to leave training and stuff like that and and again 20 odd years on if I look at that now you know I, I would just I would change that decision in a heartbeat but this is the way it goes How was the influence of Tom Burns? Uh, brilliant brilliant I just I just loved him like everybody did and um, you know he, he would just notice things in you um and take you aside and just just strip everything back to basics for you. Do you know what I mean? Um, and that just that time he spent with you, the the sort of the love that he felt you felt he was giving every one of us. And um, I, I just thought he was a, he was an amazing person. He really was. Um, and yeah, I mean, I didn't have loads of dealings with him. You know, he, he, but he just. It didn't matter who you were. It didn't matter if, like, you know, you were probably someone who who wasn't going to make the first team or whatever. He wanted to better you, and I think, again, it's not till he's kind of gone when when people from that era, not just not just myself, will look at that and think, God, he actually he, he really wanted the best for us. So um, I think we're all kind of grateful for that. You said that maybe that actually wasn't the best when you were leaving training a little bit early. Who in that squad was the best trainer at Celtic at that time? Uh, we had we had guys like Liam Miller, um, we had Colin Healy, we had Jim Goodwin, who's obviously St Mirren manager just now, uh, Liam Keogh, who I think went on to play for Inverness, Mark Kokosa, these sort of guys. I mean, they were all were all great guys. Um, but yeah, guys, guys like Liam Miller and that, you just knew that they, they, they separated themselves from it. In fact, Liam and um, um, Michael Doyle, it was, they, they two were really friendly and we kind of all stayed in Diggs and Hamilton. And they, we were all kind of similar. And I do remember, I remember Liam and um, Doyle are going to, I think they went to our house in uh, Denmark on loan. 
and I don't know what happened to them but it was almost like they just came back with a completely different attitude and they almost like really separated themselves from the rest of us um, and it paid off because they both went on to have brilliant careers obviously um, Liam again went to Man United and you know he, he, was the, he was the best of that bunch I think we all knew he was going to go on to bigger and better things Absolutely so when you're um, you're at that time and it's not looking likely that you're breaking in is the loan move a consequence of that or is it you thinking I need to go out try and improve myself to come back and get better yeah a, a bit of both to be honest um, again I had I had went from playing first team or being in around the first team at Wraith Rovers and then going to Celtic and you're involved in reserve squads that are playing on a Monday afternoon and you know again I, I look back and I shouldn't knock that but at the time that's what I was doing I was I was honestly thinking like oh, this is nonsense you know what I mean like Monday afternoon and what would happen at that time because you would basically you would be told you're playing um, from the Saturday you would be told you're playing on the Monday in the reserve game and then whoever didn't play on the first team um, whoever it may be whoever was on the bench and didn't play and if they needed games you were basically told right before it by the way you're not playing today because the manager says that we have to play whoever which again is absolutely fine because that's the way big clubs run and you have to accept it but for me it was just another thing just to think god this is rubbish so I just wanted to play Saturday football I, I did I just loved the you know having a little bit of a crowd there and being able to score and um go home and check the table at night and stuff like that I know you'd made a little bit of a difference because that's what I'd been doing and I felt like I was missing that so yeah I was. they wanted me to go on loan and I was I was obviously quick to, to take them up on it as well So you drop down leagues and it's, it's Albion Rovers mm-hmm. there's Clyde Bank and there's Queen of the South in between as well do you feel a drop in quality or do you just feel as you say you're getting first team football on a Saturday yeah. and that's fundamentally all that really matters That's all I felt I mean the Albion Rovers one was, was John McVeigh because he was my manager at Wraith for a while so he he was really wanting me to go there and like I say at that point I just wanted to play games Um so I, I didn't really mind for who like I've never been you know bothered about like I, you're right I just wanted to play games I just wanted to score goals and I, I wanted to be I suppose you just want to be appreciated in a way you know um, so yeah definite drop in quality of course it is because you've went from training with, with guys who who are raising standards every day um, to guys who it's not really a priority for them and they've got they've got jobs out with that so again looking back would I, would I change the decision? I probably would if it was, um, and I probably would think no. I need to if I, I need to play football, but I still need to go where there's, um, you know, that drive and everybody to try and better you as well um, as an individual. I know you've mentioned you maybe didn't appreciate the the reserve league quite as much. Mm-hmm. Do you understand now though? Um, we, we talk about it quite a lot, and you're looking back, and that's that's the issue really in Scotland that there's not that that bridge between youth football yeah. and then that first team do you think there is a, a room for that reserves league to come back yeah I think so to be honest yeah I do um, because I look at I look at kids now and you know they're, they're protected in a way with our like under 20 league or whatever under 90 and they keep going it's like it's always an under something league and it's just like you know you, you have to play against men do you know what I mean you, you do that you have to play against someone who's going to who wants to boot you up and down because it's all it is all character building Um and also, like I said there, you know, we were getting an opportunity to play against like an Aberdeen first team player or a Rangers first team player whenever whenever we played on these Monday games. Um, so yeah, you, you need that. Do you know what I mean? And, I, and I, I would love to see, I would love to see it back. Whether it does or not, I don't know because I think it's a. Again, just looking at like the young players when I've been working at Hearts and stuff like that, I think they would they would they would love it. Do you know what I mean? They would thrive on it. It would be tough for them. But at the end of the day, it, it, again, it would go back to that, what I said, a, a kind of sink or swim moment, and it would separate the ones who who are really wanting it enough and prepared to learn from those experiences and the ones who aren't. Absolutely. And it, it was an odd doom and gloom at Celtic, obviously, and you did make your, your debut there. Yeah. What was that moment like? Yeah, mad. It was, it was just... I remember being... You know, just that going through in the changing rooms and seeing your shirt with your name and your number on it I, like I will, I will never forget that it was genuine like total pinching myself and even now I feel it a little bit strange because you're just like as much as I had grown up a Rangers fan like Celtic are a huge club and I think it's when you go there 
it is installed in you how how big this club is and you know we we would often like go trips abroad and what have you and, and the fan base was was massive so I knew it was a big deal um, and you're almost like I remember being I think was I on the no that was after I was on the bench but I was obviously on the bench for this one against Aberdeen and I, and I seen the way the game was going and I think it was something like 3-1 at half time and I just remember being in the change rooms and it was Colin Healy had said to me he'd like shouted me over because I say we lived in the same digs together and he was like, you'll get on here, that's what he said. And, and I just remember thinking, that's like, almost like, can't believe it. Um, and then obviously when you get the call and you're going on, and I think it was, I think I came on for Mark Burchell. Um, it was, it was good. It was, it's, it's one moment that, you know, as much as I've got regrets, that can never be taken away from me. And I think that there's so many people would love to have to have experienced that, do you know what I mean? And um I'm just I'm just glad I got to it. It was a nice moment. You touched upon it earlier that maybe if Kenny Douglas was in the role a bit longer, things could have panned out differently. Do you think under Martin Neal there was never really that room for you to to get into that first team? There, there wasn't. I think um when Kenny Douglas was there and I was training with the first team almost every day. Um and then he left and then it was I had a total shift on that. I was then I was then with the reserves all the time. Again Probably being so young, my attitude wasn't wasn't great to that. Do you know what I mean? And I should have I should have just thought right, knuckle down and, and let's and let's show him. Um, but I didn't. I kind of adopted the other attitude of like, oh well, that'll be that then. And again, another another regret of mine. But yeah, so I never really had many dealings with Martin O'Neill. And I think uh, I, had, I had an instance when I was at Clyde Bank on loan, um, and I'd got I got Player of the Month and. I did a, an interview and one of the journalists for whatever reason he, he just started asking me about um, you know what Martin O'Neill thought about me getting player of the month and obviously I was like I said well I don't know and um, and he he was saying oh, what has he not phoned you and I was like well no I've not spoke with him and um, he said do you, do you not think he cares about like what you're doing and I said well I don't know you'd have to ask him and, and it was just basically like that and, and I just remember seeing the back page well it was actually Kenny McDowell phoned me at my house um, the following day and he was just saying like you know what what have you said and the manager's not happy and of course I was like defending myself I said look I haven't I haven't said anything bad and um, Martin O'Neill remember phoned me and it was probably one of the, the, very, the only dealings I really had with him um, but he obviously wasn't happy um, with the I think he took my side of the story because like I say there was there was more than there was more than one journalist there and it was only one that, that went with that and to be fair he did apologise after it but by that time it was too late, it didn't look great for me and I um, don't know whether that was a factor or whatever but it certainly it's not going to endear you is it to uh, someone of uh, Martin O'Neill's stature. Not at all, did that then kind of make the exit a little bit easier or did it <laughs> rush it along? Or? I think they did, I mean I was at, I think that, that was at Clyde Bank so yeah it wasn't long after that before uh, they were contacted me and saying like obviously you can leave and um, I mean that that was tough in itself as well but again whether it was a factor I'll never know it probably it probably was it probably was in a way do you know what I mean maybe a final thing of right let's you know we need to make a decision on, on him here if I'm looking back on it like that but I don't know who knows How big a moment when it, it, it becomes apparent that obviously time itself is coming to an end does it is it quite surreal in the f- sense that, well, do I, how do I come back from this? Mm-hmm. Does the career sort of go a little bit questionable? Or do it does. I think people, um, again, I, I just wanted to play. I just wanted to play, like, on a Saturday. That's, that's what, what I felt I loved doing. And um, you're right, like, again, looking back, it seemed a big deal for for everyone that would be saying to me, like, you know, where, where, what are you going to do now sort of thing? And... I never really thought of it like that. I just, like I say, I did just want to play. Again, I can see that point of view totally now. Um, and I, and I kind of wish I did think like that because things would have changed. Um, but I remember remember leaving there actually and feeling a little bit relieved um, that I wasn't have to go, going to have to go in there every day because it was becoming it was becoming Groundhog Day. Um, so yeah, I was I was a bit relieved and I just wanted to go and play football. Did you find a little bit of joy again then when you signed um, professionally obviously for Clyde? Um... Yeah, so I did. So I, I went there um, and 
really enjoyed it again because, like I say, it was first team football. Um, you were playing again on the Saturday, and there was big characters as well in the change rooms, like you know guys like John Potter and uh, Alan Kern, him as a manager as well. Um, so I did. I really enjoyed it. It was it was just great to be back and, and just be part of a first team. Um, so yeah, I, I loved it. When you continue your career in those lower leagues, is there a is there a expectation that you think to get back to it? Are you known as the guy who was at Celtic, the guy who yeah. was signed by Doug Leash? Is it is it does it carry? It, it did. It, honestly, it did. Like every, it was like that, and not for me. I don't think I ever thought of it that way. But you're right. Loads of people, and and, and every time, even if even if you scored a goal for you know one of these lower league teams, it would always say like ex Celtic player. It was always it was always coming out all the time. Um, so I do think that yeah, a lot of people. Um, saw me that way, and, and, it, and it, it did. It did become a little bit of a, a, a burden for me in a way. Do you know what I mean? Because I did just want to play, but I felt like I had to always live up to this expectancy that I always had to. If, if I'm playing for you know uh, Clyde or for for that, I need to be the one that's on top all the time because I'm I'm an excel player and they paid money for me. Um, so I probably started to put myself under a little bit of pressure. How did you enjoy your time up at four for? I really enjoyed it actually. It was it was totally different to what I'd been used to. Um, obviously, it was part time. Um, I went and got a job alongside it as well, and it was just again another experience that made me probably realise that actually I need to get my head together um, if I want to continue being full time football, or or if I don't, I need to obviously just accept that. Um, and it really did make make me knuckle down and think actually I don't like this training two nights a week I prefer to do it every day um, but again that's such a terrible decision from my part because that's an inability to realise I should have realised long before that that, that, was, that would have eventually happened uh, but I always get there it's just <laughs> it's usually a long journey <laughs> Is it tough to, um, to make that step from full time to part time? Yeah I get it. yeah it totally is um, and as I say you know everything everything changes from that point on um, financially and your life totally changes because see you have to start looking you know you're going to get a job um, your training times are totally different now all of a sudden you're having your dinner at, at half past four and you're you're in the car away up the, the motorway to Forford do you know what I mean so it's not it's not ideal um, but yeah it's, it's a it's a it's, it's tough to be honest it was tough you get that goal at 4 far. I think it's an assist from David Dunn and it gets you that move to, to Gillingham <laughs> that's a step up again isn't it you've got to get a bit of joy there <laughs> I definitely do I, I don't know how that happened in uh, the, the boys at arms <laughs> John Stewart used to always always wind me up about that saying it's probably one of the craziest moves in Scottish football which it is if, if I look at it like that and I, I don't actually know how it came about Um I just know that uh, Neil Cooper, I think, tried to get me at, was it Ross County? I think he tried to get me there, and he ended up going to, to Gillingham, and for whatever reason, they've they've made contact with whoever, and before you know it, I'm, I'm carting down the road to there, so um, bizarre. Again, I, I don't don't know many people that would make would make a move like that now unless they were really young and a prospect so it was Neil Cooper who took you down so it was Neil Jordan, Cooper yeah. yeah signed for Neil Cooper um, and instantly loved him I think he was just such a nice guy and unfortunately I feel like I let him down on a few occasions just with behaving quite badly and stuff um, which is a, a total regret of mine as well but there's a bit of a theme here I think you can see but <laughs> Um, no, it was it was so it was for him and, and I and I loved him. I thought he was brilliant. Uh, just wanted to play for him as much as possible. You are still quite young, and obviously you get that move down to England. Do you think you missed a big time? Um, <laughs> I don't know if I did, to be honest, because again I had just came from from having having a job. Like I was working with the council, um, you know, with like basically cutting grass and <laughs> chopping down trees and stuff like that and I remember Neil Cooper saying that when my first game I think it was against Portsmouth and I'd played really well and when he got interviewed he said something along those lines of like a few weeks ago he was chopping down trees and so I never really had it I wasn't really big time at this point I'm kind of appreciating um, kind of appreciating what I have knowing that I've I've seen another side to life 
um, and had that early learning curve. Um, but again, I don't think it made any difference. I probably, as I said, let him down a couple of times just with stupid nights out and stuff. And um, yeah, but it was it was good. I, I, I don't regret it. I just I, again, I regret a lot of the decisions that I made down there. I was down there myself. Didn't have my family with me and. Um, probably was doing things I shouldn't have been. I was just going to ask that, do you think being still so young, you've came from for like you say, it's not a, a transition many people have made, do you think the club need to give you more support or somebody just needs to maybe have that arm around you a little bit more? Possibly, yeah, possibly. Um, you know, I've never actually thought of it like that um, and, and I can't complain. Football is a tough environment and you are you are ultimately thrown in the deep end at some point in your life. You, you know you can't you can't constantly have people nursing you along. Um, it's it, it's tough. Um, so again, maybe that's maybe that's something that, that should have happened. But I've I've no regrets with anyone down there. No no problems with anyone down there. They they looked after me. They were really good. They got me settled in a house and stuff. And made sure I had a car and stuff like that. They made sure I was all right. And then uh, they. They, they brought Stephen Hislop down as well actually for uh, just not long after I'd been so I had another another Scotsman there to, to bounce off as well so it was matters good. worse though. I know it, it actually <laughs> did that's the thing is it actually uh, yeah I remember being delighted obviously that um, Hizzy was coming down because it was another Scottish guy but again two of us for whatever reason uh, <laughs> probably shouldn't have been allowed out together not at all so obviously then you come back up the road um, and it's to Livingston yeah. Rangers fan growing up but just a, a goal scoring hero in John, yeah. John Roberts and that must have been such an attraction it was and again I think uh, Rob had tried to get me before I went um, to Gillingham and I really wanted to sign for him because because of that because he was a striker um, so he he kind of kept in touch with me and I do remember driving up um, and I had my oldest boy with me, Jack, and we drove up to Livingston, I think it was a Friday, um, and I went in and I signed the contract and stuff, and I came back out and I had to drive all the way back down to England, and I, I just remember thinking to myself, what have I done? And then I hate to say that, but I just thought, what have I done? Um, I knew instantly I'd made the wrong decision and I'd signed the contract. Um, but again, you, you kind of block it out. You just think, right, this is you've, you've got to do it. You've got to go. But I'd worked so hard, I felt, to get away from Scotland. And I had a few options in England at the time. Um, but I was a little bit... I don't know if I was homesick. I, I certainly was saying I was homesick. I was missing my kids more than anything. Um, and probably used that as an excuse of thinking, right, this is the right move. But I'll never forget that feeling of just thinking, I, I don't know what I've done here. Um, and it, it went sour pretty quickly, probably because of maybe I wasn't fully invested in it. Um, my time at Gillingham, I was, I was on my own an awful lot and uh, started to struggle a little bit just like mentally and stuff. Just because of that time I spent constantly um, on my own in my flat. And I don't think the scars of that had really lifted. And by the time I came back up, I, I, f I was kind of losing a wee bit of direction again. What did make it initially just that feeling that knowing it was the wrong move altogether? Uh, I think it was just that I, I very much liked um, I liked change. I, I liked the thought of going sample. And even now, I still want to go and like see different environments, like different countries and what have you. I like to sample all that. And... Um, I had been at a stage where I had played in pretty much every ground in Scotland. I was at a stage where every time I played against a team, I knew someone from the other team, and often you'd be playing right up against them. And it just, I don't know, it just felt like it, it was a motivation of mine to get away from that and to try and challenge myself with something else. Um, I got there. The, the move to Gillingham didn't obviously work out because Neil left again pretty sharpish. And the guy that came in we didn't really get on great and I think I still did play a few games for him um, but I just worked so hard I felt like I had put in a lot of hard work to to get myself away from Scotland not that there was anything wrong with playing in Scotland I just, I just wanted to sample something else and remember I just having a few options and I was like no it always stuck in my mind that Robbo wanted me before I went to Gillingham and I really wanted to work for him I just couldn't turn the Gillingham move down so I think that was what he was the draw he was the draw that kept um, pulling me back there 
as I say, I think I realised pretty early on that it wasn't it wasn't a great one. How do you look back on your time at Livingston then? Uh, not fondly, to be honest. It's such a strange club, Livingston, and um, I still speak to. Obviously, I've been working up at St Johnston recently, and I still speak to Murray Davidson quite a few times about the time there. Listen, it was good fun and um, great bunch of guys, but. Livingston was such a strange club at the time. I think they were going through like transitions as well, and the, the board, and they, they, they didn't. They'd just been relegated as well, so they were kind of in that transition period where they're expecting to go straight back up. But probably there was a few scars from the last couple of seasons, and um, it just wasn't great. It wasn't. Uh, it wasn't that great an atmosphere to be honest so you get that move to Sweden was mm -hmm. that did your time at Livingston really just your mind was just wanting out yeah again it was it was I wanted away from there and I think the I'm a, at this point starting to think about being abroad like do you know what I mean and I still I say that to the young lads that I work with now that um, I think there comes a point like I think when you're young you want to play at the top level and the top level really is you know playing the top level in Scotland and then You've got like the Premiership in England. Like you, you always you want to reach that level, but there there always comes a point where you think, right, that's actually not going to happen now, or it's less and less likely. Um, and I always try and say to like the young lads now, I think if you reach that point, I think you should start thinking, what else is out there? Because you've got you've got an unbelievable opportunity where you can go to these countries, um, and you're getting paid to be there and. And you get to see like a different side of life. Like there is just far more to, to life than than what goes on just here. Um, so yeah, that move came about, and I, and I jumped. It. I was I was desperate to go over there, and I think we went for a few days. Me and a boy called Daryl Smiley first. Uh, we went for like a few days. It was supposed to be a trial, but they told us like a trial over there is just really to see like how you fit in with the the rest of the team. Um, and then we went we went over for good. It was nice. What was the um, the the level like over there? Level was. It was all right. They were in like Division One at the time. Um, the level was okay. I would probably liken it maybe to like maybe to like the Championship over here at that time. I think the Championship's got a lot stronger now. Um, so yeah, it, it was good. Like again, I was just I was so enthusiastic, and when I, when I feel that inside me, and, and I always whenever I went to a new club, I was always desperate to prove that that I was the best they had and it was a kind of theme that carried me everywhere that when I went I would always be flying for five or six games um, you know it was the same at Forfar it was the same at Clyde I was always flying for five or six games till I got myself to that point of where and then for whatever reason I would take my, my foot off the off the pedal a little bit um, so yeah the level was alright there was a lot of travelling involved and it was just a nice time to be honest it was a really nice town um, and, and I enjoyed it I loved it after that, you take a little bit of a break from football. Why did you feel that you needed that break? I got a bad injury in Sweden. Um, I, again at that point, um, was probably just a little bit disillusioned with football. Um, we had, you were signing like year contracts here and there. And Sweden, although it was great, they, they, were, they weren't great at paying you on time and stuff like that and you always got you always got paid but it was always like touch and go you're always like having to chase them saying look where, where's this money um, so things like that weren't good and then I, I got the injury in a game in a home game um, and ended up in hospital and I was in intensive care for a bit and I, I, it was just at that point I, th I just thought I've had enough I've honestly had enough and um, and I wanted as far away from football at that point as possible because it's tough. Like it's, it's such a tough industry. You're constantly feeling like you have to be on it every single day, um, every single day in training. You're getting judged, and you know, like the majority of people like who who have other jobs. You, if you're not feeling great one day, you can go in the office and you can like take a little bit of a breather. But the football industry is just not like that. You're constantly getting judged, and there's always someone who has an opinion on you. Um, whether it be like a manager, a coach, another player, or or just fans in general, and it's you constantly are feeling like you have to be um, on top of your game, and it and it, it started to be a wee bit exhausting. I thought so. I'd, I'd honestly just had enough, um, and decided to step away. And then, typical of me, I regretted it about three months later. <laughs> I was just gonna say, did you regret, regret so, that? Totally did. Again, I remember speaking to people at the time, and they were saying. 
just you need to stay in football like as long as you can like um, but I was being stubborn and I was like no I, I, I've had enough I think I've had enough of it um, yeah stepped away and, and totally missed it like just missed that um, everything I'm saying there about the, the pressure of playing feeling like um, everyone judging you all the time the, the environment itself if you take that away the environment itself is the best environment ever and that's why um, I'm doing what I do at this moment in time because I get the best of both worlds now where I get to enjoy everything that goes on in the week I get to enjoy all the banter the, the build up to games but I don't have to deal with I don't have to deal with running out there and, and taking powers from, from uh, people that don't even know you when you um, you're missing you're missing the the buzz and all of that, was the ambition to get back into league football or was the attraction of lower league football even even more Just enticing? Honestly, nah, it wasn't at that point. I den- I genuinely did think like my professional career was was finished, um, and I just. I think it was uh, Bonesh United. I think at the time, and I was honestly, I wasn't even fussed for going to them at this point. Then I went there. Being totally honest, I went there for the money, and that's and it's you know, it's not massive in in like professional football terms, but at the time it was decent money for for training twice a week, um, and you know you were getting like a signing on fee and stuff. So I did. I went for that reason. Wasn't fully invested in it, but the level was such that I could I could get away with it because. Uh, obviously I came from a higher level and slowly but surely I did actually start to really enjoy it again I started to look forward to Saturdays uh, started to look forward to training but again I think it was more down to the, the the banter side of it it's a different type of person when you when you go down to those levels you know what I mean because it is you, you know it's like proper people there you know what I mean they are going to work every day and, and it is, brings with it a different type of pressure a different type of banter um, and I did start to enjoy it again it is all about enjoyment at that level and I think of being the East Super League in that mm. obviously won the title as well silverware so helps no matter what level yeah you know it does it was it was, it was was good like and I hadn't won anything really when I played like every club I seemed to be at were fighting relegation all the time and, I, and again I look back and I think that's probably another reason why I wasn't um, you know I, I wasn't so it wasn't such a big decision to to leave football because I didn't have many amazing moments you know what I mean where you can you can th- recall that and think right this is why I need to keep going because I want more of that um, a lot of it was fighting relegation and stuff and um, so yeah to go into like the junior leagues and um, realised as well that actually they were they were c- quite big as well like some of the teams have got decent fan base and following um, and I think you, you start to realise that it means a hell of a lot to to the people running these clubs, and they put they put so much into it. Um, and I used to think about that a lot. And even like say times when I've, I've worked for Bonnie Rig and stuff, I, I always think about the guys like behind the scenes and um, see the work that goes into it, and it means so much to them. Um, so that kind of rubs off, and you, you you almost want the best for them. You want them to feel amazing at the end of their Saturday night when they're all out drinking with their pals. Absolutely, and, and you touched on it, obviously you did make your way through Bonnig, God's country, um, <laughs> and, you, and you played for the Rose. So, at that level, do you think people snubbed their nose a little bit? Um, looking at, obviously, they are now in the Lowland League, and back then it was just still be the Junior Leagues, but do you <laughs> think there is a general snub of the nose? I think so. I think there definitely used to be. Um, I would say now, I would say now not so much within the game, but given certain decisions that have been taken recently, you would have to say that you would have to say that there kind of is that uh, there is that there from the top, which is unfortunate because you know most people most people I speak to um, within football do talk highly of like Saboni Rig and um, you know teams like that that are, that are up and coming and they're, and they're so they're so desperate to challenge and they would be such an asset to the leagues. Um, even starting at the in the third division, they would be such an asset because they're ambitious, and they would almost raise the standard instantly of everyone else. But it just seems that there's a, a bit of a comfort zone for a lot of teams that you know, as long as they stay in the league and as long as they get their their wee parachute payment at the end of it, then then they're quite happy. And it's just unfortunate that it seems like at the top they seem to endorse that. Um, 
mentality which is which is wrong. Um, but no, I certainly from people within the game, I would say they, there's a lot of respect for clubs like Bonnierig. Obviously, you won a, a title at Bonnerig as well, and I'll, I have to ask you, or I will be slated. How did you enjoy your time at uh, New Dundas Park? Honestly, I loved it. I really loved it, um, and I think the, the only way I can show that is that I, like, I still speak to Charlie. Um, I still speak to uh, to all the guys down there, and um, honestly, I loved it. They just had such a, a brilliant, relaxed feeling about the place. Um, they were great with my kids as well. Like they, there was a stage where. Um, the kids, the kids couldn't get looked after on a Saturday, so I had to bring them to the games. And obviously, they were young. And sometimes I'd be playing games, and I'd see like my youngest one swinging on the barrier, and I'm thinking like, what's he going to do? And uh, but they were brilliant. Like they, they took them in. Like they, they made sure they were well looked after. And um, I always remember one of the games where I, I must. It was towards the end of my time at Bonnie where I kind of thought oh, this needs to change. And I just remember we were warming up and. My youngest one, I don't know what age he would have been at the time, probably about probably about seven. Um and I just remember he's shouting me when we were doing like little possession boxes and he's shouting, Dad, Dad and I'm obviously ignoring him and then eventually I've run over. I was like I was like, Liam, you can't you can't do that when I'm when I'm working and he was like, I need the toilet so he was bursting for the toilet, so I had to leave the warm up um to go make sure he went to the toilet. So I think that was a bit of a realisation that maybe I should try and fix this situation but in terms of them down there, like I, I can't speak highly enough of, of Bonnie. Like, I think they're a, they're a brilliant club. I still look out for the results just now. Um, and I've went down there and, and helped them as much as I can as well. Absolutely. So, um, always welcome, by the way. <laughs> so, Bonnie, and then there, there's Broxburn and there's Kelly and that as well. Is it just a case of dwindling out the career by that point? It was, yeah. I think it, it was always coming down to... Every time I left a club, I was always thinking, right, that's me now. And it always became someone who I knew. Um, at a club who would pick up the phone and say look any chance you could come they were, and we're looking for a striker any chance you could come and it was like I just couldn't say no um, so I would just go and do what I could do and try and help as much as I can and uh, Kelty was exactly the same as that it was like it was just down to uh, knowing I knew Tam Courts I'd played with him years previous um, so he had said about coming along um and to be honest, enjoyed it. Like it was, it became became quite social, um, and I knew I knew that's what it was about for me. Then I just enjoyed playing the games. Uh, I felt like I got a little bit of hunger back. It was just it was it was almost nice, like working on all through the weekend and getting a chance to take your anger out on um, some bricklayer at, uh, on the Saturday. So it was good, and Kelty were good with me as well because they they allowed me to start doing what I'm doing just now as well and I started doing like a bit behind the scenes with them as well so that was kind of like my first first little start of that So tell us exactly what are you doing just now? So now basically I'm a sports masseur soft tissue therapist so um, really lucky obviously that um, I managed to f- be at a full time club for, for like the last three years until obviously Covid struck and unfortunately I lost my job but since then I've just been going in and around clubs doing bits here and there and and helping where possible and it is it's, it's amazing like I love it it's such a good job um, as I said before you get the best of, best of both worlds and that you're in the environment and you know the environment that I love uh, you get to travel you get to work in all these big stadiums and get to see the, the build up that I think most people would anyone who likes football would, would, would give an arm and a leg to be involved in um, and you don't have to deal with the pressure of uh, punters. <laughs> right, so, so it's Hearts and St Johnson uh, to name but a few. So you're getting that front row seat, aren't you? It is, yeah, it definitely is. And um, yeah, I've been I've been at St Johnson now since Christmas. Uh, once or twice a week, I go up there, and I've had I've started going at Falkirk just now, and had a few other clubs, and also things are starting to pick up for like the summer now. I've had a few more calls about going at teams in the summer, so I'm actually really excited um, about what what might happen and I just I just love working with footballers I really do um, love finding out like what makes them tick and um, just trying to help them and the buzz I get just now when you help someone and they go out and just play well or score a goal like that that for me is worth worth more than any pay you can get Is it one of the happiest you've been? Uh, at the moment yeah definitely is uh, definitely is like I love it and as I say I've got I'm, I'm really grateful for the people that have, that have helped me because without 
without guys like Liam Fox who, who obviously helped me get to Hearts um, and other guys that I know who have, have put my name forward for stuff without them and, it, and I think that's important for me to realise because as much as sometimes I don't look too fondly um, on you know football career probably because of the headspace I was in I think I do really now um, look at the people that I've helped and you know even when, when I was with St Johnson at the cup final a few weeks ago and they played against Living, Livingston and now Fox is the assistant manager at Livingston so it was such a strange moment to speak to him on the pitch and I knew fine well and it, it's not lost on me on the fact that I probably wouldn't even be doing that if it wasn't for Foxy um, helping me get in at heart so it was tough because obviously I was on the winning team at the end of it um, and, and he was on, unfortunately on the losing team so but you know what that's, that's just the way it is We're, me and him will be pals forever do you know what I mean so it's, it's just nice that people have helped and, and tried to get me in places and then ultimately when they get you in it's up to you to do what, do what you do and, and hope it pays off and thankfully to this point it has What was that cup final buzz like? That was brilliant I think I hadn't I, ha- I hadn't been to a single game since Covid since the very last game in Scotland which was obviously Hearts against St Mirren when I think that was on the Friday and then football got completely stopped and I've been working at St Johnston they played Livingston two weeks I think before the cup final or two or three weeks before it I was due to go to that game I ended up couldn't go on because I was working and then they played Motherwell the week before it again I was meant to go couldn't go and one thing about losing my job at Hearts um, I was gutted I don't think it was so much the job it was more the, the people it was the relationships I'd built up um, with with the players and with the staff and the thought of not going in there every day and, and having Nasey and John Suter and that coming in and battering you for the haircut you've had or something you've posted on Instagram it was all that sort of stuff that I knew I was going to miss um, so yeah just to 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 lose your job there and one thing I was really gutted about was that I was going to miss the the Hearts Hibs semi-final right. at uh, sorry at uh, Hamden because that was one we were all looking forward to before Covid struck and the draw was made and, and I was buzzing for that game like I couldn't wait for it and obviously I, I knew I was going to miss it and I was devastated and then I just did honestly have to take a moment when when the first game I was at after that was back at Hamden um, obviously working for a different team and, and then winning and I just thought it's, it's mad how football seems to seems to play out these strange scenarios but no it was really good I loved every minute of it um, and I'm, I'm grateful for them uh, grateful to St Johnston for having me there and is this the future is this just what you see yourself doing for now happy enough yeah I do I think um, I think at some point I've always always had a, have a desire to go and live abroad again um, so I think I'll do that eventually and, and I've always kind of thought that it will be football in some fashion that will that will take me there. I don't know. I don't know how that may happen. It will probably be someone that I've played with years ago, who maybe goes and manages a team somewhere and maybe go out there. I don't know. I don't know. But I think that's for the future. I would love to do that. But for the foreseeable future, yeah, just just getting back in, working with football teams, working with players. Like I just love it. I can't, I can't get enough of it. Paul, you've been an absolute pleasure <laughs> to talk to. You. Thank you so much for joining me on Soccer Supernova. No, thanks very much for having me on.